Hello everyone, I'm Petra Olme from Tokyo Institute of Technology. I will teach uh, this lecture in the online course Complex System Spectral Methods about temporal networks, which is one of my uh, favorite research topics. I hope you all enjoy it. And I also thank the organizers for putting together this class and thank you students for uh, watching my lecture. So first I wanted to say a little bit about myself. So I'm, I have my PhD in uh, physics and uh, these logos are, are like the universities of my career. Starting from when I was a student, I started out in Uppsala University in Sweden, in the top left. Continued studying Chinese in the Stockholm University and also in Fudan University in China. Uh, I came back to Stockholm University to finish my degree and I also finished a degree in yeah, f uh, engineering or physics. Then I got my PhD from Umeå University. I uh, spent the last year in, at Nordita in Copenhagen at that time. That's the STAR logo. Then I did my postdoc with Mark Newman in Michigan and Stephanie Forrest in New Mexico. I came back to Sweden to KTH. Royal Institute of Technology, and then back to Umeå, where I did my PhD. I also had a joint appointment with the Institute for Future Studies. Now we're on the uh, third row, and then I moved to Korea. So the second last logo is the Sungyung Wan University in Korea, and the last one, where I am now, is the Tokyo Institute of Technology. So my, my career has also been kind of going around to different places, uh, my research interest, just as me in my life. That's kind of the take home message from this slide. And if you want to know more or want to see my uh, other presentations or my uh, uh, publications, you can check my homepage. Okay, so this uh, lecture, what I w I'm just going to say what I want to, to learn from this point. I know this is a class in about, uh, or the course is about spectral methods. And this lecture will not have many spectral methods. But I hope you can uh, f apply the, what you learn from the other lectures to temporal networks. Because temporal networks is a field that has a, a lot of low-hanging fruits and many open questions. And many questions that also can be solved by spectral methods. And it's not very hard to get started. I wanted to have that feeling after seeing my lecture. So it will be pretty basic, maybe more basic than other lectures. But uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. And I also want to teach you, of course, the first point. That uh, there are a lot of temporal structure that is uh, important for... Uh, for many real-world phenomena, and we cannot ignore it. So let's get started. And I also want to start this slideshow a little bit slow. So I just want to uh, give some kind of brief introduction to network science. Uh, such a, it also applies to temporal networks, both static and temporal. So I'm sure many of you have seen this illustration. It's, uh, I think, originally an um, Indian or Thai Buddhist uh, il illustration, making a little bit different point. But uh, my story to this picture of an elephant and a blind people examining it, so they see different things than an elephant, is that uh, to understand like a complex big system, you have to step back and look from a distance. You cannot be too close. And like stepping back and looking from a distance, what that really means is to, to throw away details. And one way of throwing away details consistently is to represent the system as a network. But this is kind of where the analogy breaks down, but because like yeah, you can't. <laughs> like representing a, an elephant as a network is maybe not such a good idea. But uh, another a system where it is a good idea is the interaction between people. So in this slide I, I want to kind of explain the, the kind of uh, four-step procedure that how to do network science. And the first thing of course you have to do is to observe your system and make a network of it. 
so in this case, uh, yeah, assume that we, this is the network we get, but you have to measure something. You can measure the number of triangles, and it should be four, not three, but uh, yeah, just to test you. Uh, okay. So you take your system and measure the network and measure something about the network, the number of triangles. But what does it mean? Okay, uh, four triangles, like so what? Well, what does it really mean? This is when the network science comes in because this is where we we have to be able to interpret this number. It's like four. Is it a big or a small number? If it's a big number, then we can draw the conclusion that among the people we study, there is a tendency for triangles to form. And then kind of continue asking, like, why? Or we can kind of draw a conclusion, not about the, the system, the network itself and how it's formed, but about the uh, like dynamic system on the network. So for example, like uh, if you have many triangles, maybe rumors will spread more slowly. And then you can ask this kind of more like engineering question, like how can we improve this thing? So this was all for a uh, static network, like networks that don't move. What about temporal networks or dynamic networks? So this is the kind of uh, cartoon you can have in your mind for what temporal networks really are. So let's follow this girl around her everyday life. So at, at different times of the day, she meets different people. So this kind of illustrate two aspects of of uh, human contacts. So one is the temporal aspects, like wh when people meet. And then the other one is the network structure, the binary interaction. And there can be like uh, structures or regularities in both time and the network that affects things, like how rumors spread or how disease spread. And temporal network, the study of temporal networks is about understanding uh, this connection between the structures in time and topology or network structure and the dynamics on the on the system like, like opinion information spreading disease spreading and so on. so yeah no no you meant okay so i took the triangles as an example of a network structure like what is a good example of a temporal structure so so one thing you can do is that you go to your email outbox and then you make a timeline uh, of when you send things so not receive but when you send things when you send emails and you can make this kind of uh, like a yeah, timeline like i did here so i don't think this is email i don't think i ever send this many email but but this is something i did for a popular science uh, article in swedish so you can practice uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in Swedish here. Uh, but you can see one thing you can see here is that uh, these lines are not kind of uh, randomly scattered around. There are some big gaps. It's like when I sleep, right? Or and then there are some kind of intense activities or burst of activities when uh, that would be like when I have time to sit down and send my thing. So this is called a bursty behavior when you have this kind of long gaps and an intense burst of activity. And that's very common in, in many temporal networks. We'll talk more about that later, but now it's a, just an example of a temporal structure. And Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about like how to understand network structure and function. And this, of course, applies for uh, both temporal and static networks. Uh, we can call it the central dogma of network science by analogy to biology. Uh, and the, the first thing which I already alluded to is that networks are uh, have some kind of structure. And the, the structure, what, what the definition of structure is uh, that like this is the way a network uh, differs from a random network. And like uh, Understanding the structure means that we can understand how the network formed. So, so how can we do this? If we go into details in this definition, this how part means that we need to measure 
quantities. We need to measure the number of triangles, for example. And we have to compare it to something. Because what is a random network? We have to compare it to the same quantity, same, the number of triangles, for example, in a null model, in a random model. And then the, from this, we can learn something about how the system w evolves, what are the kind of uh, mechanisms that drives the evolution of the network, and also like how would dynamic systems, such as like spreading phenomena or random walks and so on, how would they behave on the network? So th this is, I call it central dogma one, because it's about the entire system. Now we can zoom in and look at like, uh, nodes and individual nodes and links. So they have pos positions in the network. They are located at spe specific places, right? Uh, so position tells us something about where a node, how it is connected to the rest of the network. And the, in, to understand a position of a node or a link, we don't have to have a null model. But still, we have to measure quantities, of course. But we can, uh, instead of comparing to a null model, we can compare it to nodes and links in the rest of the network. So position is something that tells us about the nodes or links role in the evolution of the system and also <laughs> like how the dynamic system on the network is affected by this node. So you can uh, turn position metrics into some importance measure. What, what is an important node or link? <coughs> Excuse me. So, so for network structure, we can measure typically the degree distribution, the density of triangles, community structure, that's kind of like finding dense groups in the network, and the measuring network positions. Example of that would be the clustering coefficient, degree assortativity, centrality measures, and I think you heard about this in other lectures in this school, or otherwise it would be quick uh, to, to find the references to learn about it. And of course the strength of network science in general is that it, it's just so wide. It applies to so many things. So just to just show you some examples, this is what I used to do to kind of motivate network science for mo many people. Maybe maybe you already uh, you already know that it's important for you, so you don't you can skip it. But anyway, like this is power grids. So power grids are, are like very tangible networks that are also of course very important, and we can also see them everywhere. You just go into the countryside, and they are just there. A very good network. Uh, another example is the social network. So this is a Norman, Norman Rockwell painting. It uh, shows like a rumor going from the beginning to the end and it kind of cycles back in the end, which is maybe not so representative. Especially this cycle is kind of like too, maybe too long. But anyway, it's an example both of a, a interesting network, the social network and a dynamic process on the network. Okay, so here's my next example of application of network science. It, it's a food web. It's a network of who eats whom among a, a different species in the African savanna. And of course, this is important, especially now when we're facing climate change and we want to maintain the biodiversity to understand how, how this, uh, the structure of a food web affects the stability. And finally, and this is a little bit just to show just how wide the uh, network can be applied. This is a picture, it's a sketch of a, a rock, uh, rock carvings in a cave in India showing the different events in the life of an Indian prince. And uh, the point of this is that uh, a narrator can tell the story of the life of the prince by standing next to to this uh, grot, uh, like a, the rock carving, and uh, uh, pointing to the wall, and then different events that are related to each other are next to each other. So this is a uh, it's called a narrative network. So different events are connected by cause and uh, causal relationships. 
uh, just to show you. Of course, there are so many other uh, types of networks, computer networks, uh, networks in manufacturing, finance, uh, biological networks, brain networks, even like, yeah, you can even analyze games with networks, everything exists, language and so on. Okay, so, so th these are, most of these networks are just, probably just static, but uh, many of them, you can understand them as a temporal network too. And okay, let's be a little bit boring now. This has been kind of like the nice pictures and so on. When I get the temporal network to my computer, it, it almost always looks like this. So it's a, like a three by N matrix, basically, with like three columns, one showing the ID numbers of nodes and the third one showing the time. Each line represents an event. So it could be like an email being sent or like two persons meeting at a time and something happening between two persons at one time. And of course, this is kind of, uh, this is a good format for a computer to read, uh, but it's kind of not a good format for humans to kind of reason about it. And I'll come back to that later. Let me just show you another uh, type of format, another way of representing uh, temporal networks, uh, which is, uh, which would be uh, especially appropriate for this class because th this is where you can uh, uh, talk about the uh, spectral methods. So this is called like a, you, you know the adjacency matrix for a static network. So it's a matrix where the element ij is zero if there is a no link between i and j. And it's one if there is a link. In the temporal networks, we have, uh, uh, the time is resolved, right? So you have to, uh, so it, what, what's a matrix in for static networks becomes a, a, a three-dimensional tensor for temporal network. Well, yeah, I'm sure you, you can uh, understand this. Then, uh, Another type of temporal network, and you know, many time, times, uh, it's not temporal network represents like two persons may, maybe meeting, discussing something, and they leaving after a while. So the, the contact in the temporal network in that case is extended in time. So then you can represent the the time of a con like duration of a contact, the beginning and the end, as an interval, as like uh, two numbers. So the, this is called an interval graph. And here, uh, you, you might want to kind of like stop and think for a while, because, I mean, even if you can kind of uh, mathematically transform different representation to each other, and in fact, all of these, uh, I mean, you can more or less without any uh, loss, uh, yeah, kind of convert to one another. But, but it actually, it actually makes a little bit of a difference. And because it makes a difference in how you think about the network. So you're, even this kind of very abstract representations, I can see from reading papers, for example, that people who are typically thinking of their temporal network as a, this kind of list of contacts, as we see here, or the interval graphs, or like a tensor, they get different ideas and they, uh, they kind of uh, get different, apply different methods. And of course it works in the other way around too. If you want to apply some specific methods, you should choose a representation that fits it. So, so this is a bit of a, f a philosophical question and there's kind of no clear answer. And I mean, it's, I cannot even guide you, but it's good to be aware of this. Then, okay, let's uh, turn to graphical ref representations because as humans, when we want to think of something, if we want to come up with a method to analyze temporal networks, we rather want to have some kind of graphical representation in mind. Just as we can draw like a network of uh, people, we want to kind of draw a temporal network. And this shows a timeline representation. So here, every line is a person and there's a, this a vertical connection if there is a contact 
at that particular time between these two persons. So this is a good uh, representation if you want to see the structure in time. But you kind of lose the feeling for like how things are connected into the network topology. If you look at this, you can see that there is some kind of gap when, with no activity between uh, time 11 and 16, but there is a like, high activity around 10. That, that's very kind of visually accessible, that information. But you don't see, you can't count the triangles very easily. You have to kind of think a little bit before you can do that. So. And another uh, graphical representation would be to make a similar timeline, but of links, and uh, just show the uh, contacts at the link. Then you lose all the the static network structure, but you get this feeling for the burstiness better. Or you can go in the other direction. You can just project all the uh, contacts to a, sta a regular static network and kind of put the uh, times of the contacts on the links. But then you lose the feeling for when things happen. So this is a, a bit of the dilemma that the, there is no fantastic uh, representation. Yeah, I was. I also have to measure, mention that there, of course we, we also have this uh, we could make like a film clip of course like showing all the uh, contacts as they evolve in time but then we of course then we lose the we don't see all the information at once so in short like the power of static networks is that we can show we can draw the network and show it to just anybody, someone who is not interested in science whatsoever, and show how things uh, spread around this network, and they'll understand it. And it's also great for us, because we can just draw it and then see things spreading on the network and understand uh, and kind of reason about uh, networks in this way. But temporal network, it's not like that. It's much more... Uh, yeah, it's uh, more difficult to visualize it. So that's to some extent something we have to live with, but uh, that much said, there might be better visualizations that, than the ones we have seen. Okay, so like now what, we, we have the basics. We understand what the temporal network is, the mathematical representations. Now we want to study the world, right? So what kind of Tem empirical temporal networks are there around. So uh, one type of network people have been really interested in studying is this uh, proximity networks. Basically like two per when two persons are close to each other. So, so in, in a normal lecture I would point at you and say that okay we're all in this room together and like we're all kind of close to each other. This would be recorded in the proximity network. Now it's an online lecture, so we're not. So we are all isolated, but anyway. So people have been really ingenious to uh, record these different types of proximity networks and uh, used many different types of uh, tools to do that. Uh, this RFID tags is most, maybe the, the most successful and most common one. So this is um, my conference tag. Uh, from a conference a few years ago. So you can see this uh, little chip. It is an RFID sensor that records uh, when I'm close to another person with a chip like this within one and a half meter, roughly one and a half meter distance. So, okay, so th this is a illustration of, of like how people move around for another conference. This is not the conference where I, I was. But this is once again kind of showing the kind of complexity of uh, this type of data when you get it. It also shows like, okay, uh, like you can, you can kind of uh, pause this video and see the kind of static network structure. But you, uh, if you see a film like this, you can't really kind of like reason uh, because you don't see everything at once, so you don't you don't really have a feeling for if everybody meets everybody or 
yeah, so many things. Uh, just saying that once again, there's uh, no like perfect uh, visualization. And now I'm just co going to continue. So that okay, uh, on the previous slide I showed you uh, many different ways of measuring uh, proximity networks. There are also human interaction networks where we like me uh, and you, the audience, could be connected because we are kind of uh, all participating in this online class. And then, of course, electronic communication, I already mentioned, emails and so social media measures, uh, messages and, and so on. And people have been interested in temporal networks applied to transportation networks, like air, air travel, also neuroscience. Uh, both at the kind of neuronal level and brain level in ecology and population biology there are they are also not they are not so well studied i think this is like a potentially uh, low hanging fruit for applications uh, there are animal social networks uh, about the zebras monkeys and uh, ants and so on. So the ants are typically measured by a camera and uh, when they stop and interact uh, uh, there is some kind of video processing software that uh, identifies this contact. While in the, like larger animals when they, they have this kind of GPS tracker and when the, the kind of one animal Oh, the, the kind of GPS location of two animals overlap. You can call that a contact. And people study the economic networks by uh, like credit con transaction loans and so on by the temporal network. In biology, there are many temporal network uh, systems that could be modeled as temporal network like gene regulation protein interaction and so on but the, also the the uh, quality of the data has not been so good so far but they, of course they do uh, improve all the time so i think that this is another area of application that we should keep in mind Okay, so the, before I talked about this kind of lossless uh, representation, where all representations that have everything in the network, of course we can kind of like uh, project a temporal network to a static network. Because, of course, the static networks, we have so much more uh, uh, tools to study them, right? So, so one way, will, and the kind of most common way of doing it is to use something called a reachability graph. So in this network, it's not like every node can uh, reach it, each other. So if you take the, if you think of this as, as a static network and you remove all the timestamps on the edges, then of course you can go from one node to another through the network, right? So all the nodes are indirectly connected. But this is not true for if you think of it as a temporal network, because there, yeah, so there is no way of going from A to E or from E to A. There is no way of going from A to D, but you could go from D to A in the previous picture. So this is called a reachability graph, where uh, one directed edge means that you can go from one node to another following uh, this uh, we call it the time respecting path so following like an increasing sequence of contacts because yeah in a, if you kind of traverse or travel in a temporal network you cannot go backward in time right in, in the most uh, practical applications and yeah th this shows another type of, of uh, way of kind of reducing a static network to a temporal network. This is kind of keeping all the information, but it is kind of destroying the meaning of a node. So instead of one node, you replace it by a node at a given time. And the, yeah, 
we can think of this in many different ways, but like if you think about conferences and conferences would be kind of connected by the participants. If, if uh, two conferences have a common participants, they, then they are connected. Then in, in uh, like all the other representations, say like a conference like NetSci, which is the biggest network science conference, would be like one node. But in a time node prediction network, it will be like net, net side 2017, net side 2018, net side 2019, and so on. That would be a node. So a node is kind of like an object at a given time. And another way of making a static network is to make a time slices of the network. So you, uh, you connect the nodes that are uh, have a, a contact within some kind of time window. And the, the network structure itself ma is very sensitive to the size of the network. So, so and this is a, um, from a paper by the Sune Lehmann's group. They, they show that as you, uh, as you decrease the time window size, the network kind of uh, starts breaking down. And uh, here we can stop and, and think for a while. Like, so what does it mean in it? In a, even in this representation, uh, the network being kind of fragmented. It, it's uh, it's still meaningful. This means that people are together, maybe in a room, in a classroom, or in a car, or in a bus, or something. But uh, in a this is for a temporal network. It makes sense to have a fragmented network, but in a static network, it doesn't make sense. And yeah, so the, this is one one thing we can think about. There's kind of uh, kind of fundamental difference between temporal and static networks. And uh, we can also think about like uh, what uh, we like to talk about time scales in uh, complex system research. Like, uh, what does this mean with respect to time scale? And like, how can we use this type of fragmentation to, to uh, kind of characterize the time scales of a, of a network? And th there is kind of, I will talk a bit more about this later. When I at the end of this talk, I hope to present some of my own projects. But but yeah, this is a kind of open question. And. Just as in static network, it's important to uh, the concept of path and shortest path is uh, also important for static network. But also this becomes a different thing. So I already told you that the time respecting path is a path that doesn't go back in time. So it's very clearly visible in this time of, type of timeline graph where, because the, it's kind of a line that yeah doesn't kind of go back in time. An important uh, metrics for characterizing paths is called latency. And this comes from the computer science literature. Leslie Lamport, actually the inventor of the LaTeX late, uh, typesetting system, he, he was the first to discuss this. So latency is, is the duration of the shortest time respecting path from I to J starting at, at a specific time. So essentially, all the, whenever you generalize uh, something from static networks, this will become time dependent in a static network, in a temporal network. Also a simple concept as a path. Then of course you can kind of average average out the time and so on. But uh, to start with, of course you shouldn't do that. And latency typically have this kind of like a sawtooth pattern where it kind of, whenever there is contact, the latency goes up. It's like you miss, you miss the bus so you have to wait longer. Another important concept is reachability. And there are a few different definitions around the literature. One is the fraction of vertex pairs at a certain time that are connected by a time respecting path. But in, in general, reachability tells us how large a fraction of the network is connected at a given time. Another thing is, uh, is called burstiness. So the, this is uh, something I also mentioned before with my emails. So people have this kind of like bursty behavior. This is data from a prostitution, from an online community uh, uh, 
of sex buyers that evaluate their experience with uh, uh, prostitutes or escorts and uh, so the uh, the lines at the where it says escort it shows when this escort is active so this itself has a bursty behavior and the sex buyer this, this lines shows when he has bought sex and that is also bursty it also has this kind of gap and like intense periods and then the lines that goes through both are the ones between this particular escort and this particular sex buyer. And so it's kind of a link property, which is also bursty. And then burstiness is something that we typically measure by this, uh, this uh, fun factor or uh, coefficient of variation of the time between events. It's from this paper by Go and Barabasi, you can see in the lower side of the screen. Another measure that is uh, very kind of important or a, a structure that is important is the persistent pattern. So like, so, so many types of temporal networks, so you can think of the, these proximity networks where people are close together. Like the probability that you will be close together kind of in the next time step is, is high. If you've been together at, uh, time one, then probably you will be together at time one, two as well. And this could be measured by this adjacency correlation function by uh, Aaron Closet and Nathan Eagle. Or you can, uh, you can in principle think of many other way of measuring it, but, but the important thing is the, the idea that uh, a st very strong effect in temporal network is this, uh, uh, autocorrelation that they, if two things are connected at one time they will be connected uh, soon after too and this as I already said like all the, this concept generalized from static network they will be time dependent including uh, ideas as like uh, components strongly and weakly connected components and uh, yeah all, all other types of static network measures so how to predict the out time is a, is, it's a, it's not the kind of like easy thing to do. I recommend you to, to look in the literature or kind of think for yourself. The, I think there are always many ways of doing things, uh, but there might not be like one definitely best way of doing it. So in many cases in my projects, I reach this point and what should I do? How should I proceed? And in the end, you just end up uh, trying to do the simplest uh, thing you can come up with. But even what's the simplest thing is sometimes not clear. And this is true for like centrality measures too. So I think all of the classical centrality measures uh, between us, eigenvector centrality, uh, closeness centrality, they can be generalized to temporal networks. But they, they will, uh, typically by uh, replacing uh, distance by latency, but they will measure a little bit different things. Okay, so he here we can also kind of stop and think for a while because uh, in many problems in for static networks, this kind of size scaling is important, taking the n goes to infinity limit. This is not uh, straightforward at all for temporal network. In fact, there is almost n no good way of doing it. I mean, uh, because if you rescale the duration of a, a, a temporal network, then you also would have to rescale the number of nodes. Because, yes, say you kind of like, you sample a group of people for uh, one day, and you think of a spreading phenomena, then you kind of you kind of scale up in your simulation this data set to ten days. Then maybe this spreading phenomena can spread to everybody, while originally it couldn't do it. So that, that means you change kind of very fundamental property. Uh, you kind of de destroyed one structure, uh, one feature of the original data set that you rather want to keep. 
And uh, yeah, so, so that also means that uh, kind of rescaling, uh, sizing up, scaling up and down uh, temporal networks is actually something that you should do kind of with respect to a dynamic system and like how to take this into account. Th these are things that are completely unknown. And I welcome you all to kind of both uh, kind of contribute to the temporal network science and solve this problem. How, how can you deal with this kind of thing and, and bring this finite size, sing, no, finite size scaling uh, framework that is very powerful for st uh, static network into temporal networks? Or uh, at least you, you should kind of like keep this in, in mind that it's not the easy thing to kind of like resample or change the size of a uh, temporal network. Now let me say a little bit about like coding and software and uh, I mean there, there is no kind of like standalone app that you can download to analyze temporal network. There are say Gephi that's uh, pretty good for a uh, static network. There, it also has some kind of temporal network functionality so I can recommend that. But uh, if you want to kind of contribute to the science you would have to code for yourself uh, and use some kind of general language. Uh, I myself use Python or, or C. I, I think you can use R, MATLAB, or other other ones as well. And uh, there are some there are some temporal network packages for Python, for example, but it's not as complete as for static networks. And uh, typically, the file format would be this kind of contact sequences, and sometimes interval graphs. So it's not true. I I have seen interval graphs. But 99% uh, are contact sequences. And like in, in your code, you can uh, typically use contact sequences as well, or like, like a linked list with uh, contacts on the list, uh, link or adjacency list, uh, this typical structure for static networks with kind of like another um, list of all the contacts per link. Or you can have this kind of adjacent to the tensors, as I mentioned, if you're studying spectral properties. Or as this kind of uh, screenshot sh shows, and this is C, I think, or I know, it's the uh, like uh, br uh, breaks it down the data into each time step. So each time step uh, stores the number of contacts this particular time step, and then the nodes that are connected. These are, in, in my case, I store it as a arrays of unsigned ints. And yeah. And okay, so, so this is another time to stop and think for a while. When you write the code, this is something, a point where every temporal network person will have to stop and think. Because say there are two contacts at the same time between A and B and B and C. And then typically you're studying some kind of spreading phenomenon, maybe like a disease spreading. In this situation, can things spread from A to C via B or not? I mean, the, this, there is no like, kind of general answer to this. You have to kind of think of the dynamic system. If it's a disease spreading, is it possible that uh, during one time step, one Person B can kind of get infected and then uh, transfer the disease to a person C. Okay. And uh, yeah, the responses in your code would be different. So if one thing you can do is that you allow for the spreading, but then you have to then you have to think about what happens really within one time step. Then if you want to be principal, you have to kind of uh, repeat whatever you're doing with the, the contacts coming in random orders and then take average over this many ran randomizations. Yeah. Okay, so for dynamic processes, just for as for static networks, in temporal networks, we're interested in something uh, spreading on top of a network. And usually the interesting thing is like a one-to-many interaction, like spreading or disease spreading modeled by simple contagion models like SIR, SIS, and so on, or opinion spreading models, rumor spreading, and this could be like modeled by, say, threshold models or so on. 
a little bit less interesting because like just what is the application here is the uh, random walks so like uh, of course random walks are very fundamental and you can use them to probe a uh, temporal network uh, but uh, there are not so many systems in reality that, uh, that I can think of that are at Mo well modeled by a random walk on a temporal network and then of course there are other things too like synchronization problems game theorems and so on you can study so this is similar to static networks there is a rich number of uh, a kind of rich set of dynamical systems that you can study on a temporal network and the most common one to study is epidemics. So just to introduce you a little bit to modeling epidemic spreading of infectious disease, then I have some cartoons for you. So in the, this picture, on the left, we see a person that has the disease, an infectious person, and a person that can get the disease, a susceptible, having a contact. So this is once again in temporal network is like like one row in this uh, list of contacts. So two persons having contact, and then after some time, then the susceptible susceptible will become infectious. And then after a while, the infectious will of course become recovered. So this kind of defines the two fundamental uh, then. Uh, epidemic models, the susceptible infectious susceptible and susceptible infectious recovered models. One for diseases that you become immune to after you recovered and one for the ones where you get resusceptible. And typically these steps are modeled by either transmission probability per contact transmission probability. That's the most appropriate for temporal network studies, right? Uh, and the second step is that you would become uh, susceptible or recovered uh, after some fixed amount of time or more commonly uh, with uh, uh, so this kind of some time uh, chance per time unit which gives an exponentially distributed uh, infectious period. Uh, this is the common way of doing it in mathematical epidemiology. And so, it, but of course, we also need this kind of like uh, population structure. So this uh, SIS, SIR, they, they just kind of sh uh, show the different types of uh, sta states with respect to the disease and like how they you can transfer between them. But there is also the social component, and this is where a temporal network comes in. And. Yeah, then uh, if you check my blog post, I, I have some uh, on my blog. I have some blog post about how to model uh, temporal disease spreading on temporal networks properly. And one thing that's not very uh, easy or straightforward how to do is like how to choose the seed of an infection in a temporal network dataset. You, I mean, if you don't know anything then you should choose something with as random as possible that's the usual principle but that might mean that you choose someone who is just present in the very end of the data set and then of course a disease cannot spread to many people which you can argue is not uh, uh, so representative but but on the other hand that's the most principled way to do and that's the way i usually do too but but yeah this is something to think about like and there, there is no like uh, crystal clear uh, answer to how to choose someone to infect. So typically, what I do is that I, st I start an outbreak at one node, and then I pick a source node uniformly at random, and I also pick a time between the beginning and the end of the data set at random to start the disease, and. Uh, and then if two nodes are in contact at one time, I, I don't make, I don't let the disease spread through two contacts. And otherwise infection probability and uh, is the same for all contacts. And I let the infection uh, go for an 
exponentially distributed time to kind of conform to the literature. And that, okay, algorithms, that's something I also have a post on my blog if you want to check. But essentially, it's extremely uh, easy to make a straightforward algorithm. You just run through the contact list and just run the SIR states on, on this. But uh, you can make something much faster. And uh, yeah, once again, this is something you can check my blog and I also have a uh, code on github for uh, making something called uh, yeah uh, pr oh, what's it called event driven modeling of temporal network disease spreading on temporal networks so I'm not going to go so much into details you can check my github page or I have or, or there is also uh, this book mathematics of epidemics and networks with also Python code, not for temporal networks, but anyway. Okay, so now, now I talked a bit about what is temporal networks, what are the different types of temporal networks out there, uh, how to study them, what, what kind of uh, software to use. Uh, next I will talk a bit about my own research and I realize I should cut this slideshow uh, short a bit because uh, time is ticking but uh, so when I uh, the first thing I was interested in when I uh, came to this subject uh, this was uh, when I kind of my last year as a PhD student my first year as a postdoc I, I made my first temporal network paper around uh, 2005. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, okay, so first thing I want to argue that, of course, I, I told you in the beginning that uh, network representation is a good way of making complicated system simple. Now, of course, if we add time and kind of contradict that, so you have to get something out of making your network, your representation more complicated. Um, okay, so the first thing I already told you that temporal networks are not transitive. In this network you can go from A to B, you can go from B to D, but you cannot go from A to D because you can reach B by the time 11 and then all uh, contacts between B and D already happen. But you can, you can continue to C by time 17, but then, then all contacts between C and D already happen. So there is no connection from A to D. So, and this, all uh, static networks are transitive, right? Even, uh, even directed networks. This means that this kind of hints that temporal networks is something fundamentally different. And that, that kind of, I get that confirmed all the time. So my first study of a uh, spreading process was based on our study of this prostitution data that I already mentioned. So it's a, uh, yeah, I also mentioned kind of how it works. So, so this is like how this is uh, spreads in the worst case scenario on this network. And I think the slide is cut there, but the, it's a time on the X axis. And we can see that this is spreading, taking off slowly and then spreading roughly linearly. And we wanted in a follow-up study to see like how does the order of event affect how things happen. And uh, so yeah, so we can, so what we do is that we take this list of contacts and then we just kind of randomize the timestamps of things and see how in our case then things spread slower in the randomized network, meaning that there's something in the data that kind of speeds up the disease spreading. So this is kind of funny because uh, the week after we put this paper on archive, I went to a conference and met this uh, Finnish guy, Jari Sarameki, who and we started chatting and realized that we put like, uh, we did exactly the same analysis. And they, they scooped us, right? You can see they were four days before ahead of us with this result. 
Well, we use the sexual uh, encounters in the prostitution data. They use the cell phone data. And they found the opposite thing. Uh, so, yeah, so, so in the cell phone data, then the spreading becomes kind of slowed down by the, the order of event. And I should, before I continue, I should just say, okay, these curves are very close to each other in the previous slide. But uh, so this is some much more modern data. And now it's a kind of, uh, th so this shows the difference between the outbreak size predicted in a static and uh, a like a, a real temporal network and a temporal network that is kind of randomized by swapping the contacts in the same way as before. And you can see from for some data set, the difference is like 60%. So this is huge. The time the order of events can make a really big difference. But okay, back to this, uh, uh, my encounter with Yari Sarmeki. So we couldn't really figure out why they, they saw a slowed down effect and we saw a speed up effect. But we agreed to write a review paper. So th this is kind of like, but by then uh, I knew the temporal networks would be kind of a main research theme in the years to come. We also were editors of a book. We have another follow-up volume to this one coming up. So it was good for my career, even though the Finnish group scooped us. Okay, so, so one thing the Finnish di group did was they did, did better than us, is that they didn't only kind of shuffle the time and look at the response. They made a lot of other randomizations. So th this kind of... So, so by kind of gradually destroying the structure, the structure of the order of events, that uh, by swapping the timestamps, you can do that, but then you don't destroy the, the kind of like average activity over the day. So for example, at night, there is less activity than during the day. That you can destroy by uh, kind of reassigning the timestamp from a, a uniform distribution, for example. And you can also go in the other way and kind of keep more of the original structure in your randomization. So you can use this kind of randomization technique to show exactly what do you want to keep in your original data to reproduce uh, what you see in the original data. So, so randomization techniques in static networks is pretty limited. You can basically just sample the configuration model by doing it, but in temporal network is much richer. And uh, so that's another example for like how, just how different temporal network and static networks are. So yeah, this is just showing how you can destroy the time, how you can, uh, uh, no, how you can destroy the order of events. This is how you can destroy the time that you replace, replace the timestamps by uh, random numbers. And then you can, of course, uh, shuffle entire contacts of a link. And you can, uh, like that, and you can uh, also restrict yourself to like uh, links with the same weight. And this is like kind of keeping more of the original structure. So, so then in static networks, typically, you kind of we mod we take the empirical network and find like what kind of uh, model network that can reproduce them, and we study the model networks. In temporal networks, uh, I mean there is the there is an argument. I mean you have to make the choice is not that easy. I mean, you can, I always actually keep studying empirical networks just because it's very difficult to make a network model that keeps all the, the possible structure. Okay, now let me kind of go a little bit faster. I think you can pause the slide and kind of read if you're interested. But, but uh, okay, so temp motifs like small overrepresented subgraphs is something people are interested in. In, in the uh, static network. And there, some uh, part of the temporal network 
literature also study that. You can, you can, I think you can just search temporal network motif and you will find the, the important uh, citation. And uh, as I mentioned, like uh, models that generate the temporal network is also uh, like difficult. It's, it's difficult because we don't even have a clear view of like what are the important structures in temporal network. Even though this field has been going for like five, ten years, it, people are not still not completely sure how to do it. <coughs> so, uh, but but still there are there are this uh, model based study. There is a, a famous model called called the, well, I, I forget, but by Nicola Perra et al. Uh, Activity-driven model. Okay, there, now you, you got it. Okay, uh, and here's another kind of counterpart of the, uh, the configuration model for a static network that you can uh, construct the temporal network by first kind of drawing degrees, then you connect them to a static network, then you kind of uh, create the uh, kind of intervals when each edge is active. You generate some kind of time series, maybe with a bursty pattern, and then you kind of wrap this time series onto these uh, intervals, and then uh, delete the intervals, and voila, you have a temporal network. And uh, in the previous slide, I have the reference for that. But uh, this is a yet another time we can stop and think for a while because in the temporal network what is a contact is is sometimes kind of like an effect of the process that we want to study so it, it's a uh, like how to model a temporal network yeah for, for many reasons both because we don't know the, all the structures and then also like what the a kind of contact actually means so so we typically we want to if we want to study kind of information spreading and we take the data from an email uh, network and kind of model some kind of spreading process by a SIR model on top of this i don't know if it makes sense but we could do it but but then the question is like i mean uh, don't you use emails to spread what you want to the information you want to spread it's not that that the, the information you, you want to write an email to someone and then you just put all the information you have there. So, so just from a fun, fundamental modeling point of view, you have to be aware that the, say the links in a static network and the contacts of a temporal network are not really one-to-one uh, -one mapping between them. Okay, so, so in, in Static networks, we have this fat tail intervent time distribution. There was this idea that that kind of slows down spreading. That explains this uh, Finnish group's finding of for uh, for the uh, cell phone data. But it, that, the fact is that this in the our prostitution data, it is also it also has fat tail intervent times. But now the that kind of sp something speeds up the disease spreading. And what is it? So there was actually many uh, studies that kind of just assumed that uh, this kind of burst intervent time distribution is the most important thing, most important temporal structure, and let's just study that. But it's uh, it's not the case. Uh, it's not a, a so interesting direction to go. So what could it be that is more important? Like, uh, at least for like disease spreading. Well, I mean, there could be this beginning of a relationship and then an end of a relationship. This is actually a very clear structure in many of the empirical data set that uh, people interact with each other has a very st uh, clear beginning and an end. So this was uh, kind of, yeah, this was maybe my first uh, temporal network paper as a PhD student back in 2003. But the other people made the same uh, observation. So in, in a study uh, that we published, uh, yeah, now it's maybe like five years ago or even more, uh, 
we can in contrast contrast two pictures that are simplifying a temporal network. One is we call it the ongoing link picture, assuming that whatever you see a contact, it's sampled from a link in a static network that was there before and will be there after the data. Contrast that with a sim uh, another type of data set, which is like a link turnover picture, which is more like this kind of beginning and end of relationship, that the relationship starts at some point and ends at some point. And we, we argue that this second one is the most important one, and we do it by some ran randomization type model. Actually, in this case, we, we didn't have computer power to do full randomization, so instead we destroyed it by making everything equal or uh, destroying this uh, like key so the first one destroys the intervent time structure the second one destroys the uh, where we kind of shift all the contacts to the beginning it destroys this kind of link turnover picture or we could shift it to the end too and then we measure the SIR model outbreak size so as in temporal networks the SIR model has two parameter values uh, determining the probability of getting disease transferred and the duration of the disease. And what happens if we, we kind of destroy the intervent time, the burstiness? Well, this happens, almost nothing at all. But if we destroy the beginning time, then something more happens. And if we destroy the end times, something more happens. So, But, I mean, this together with some other argument made us think that yeah, this kind of turnover of uh, links is, is something very important, that uh, when the links start and end is much more important than the, the kind of tempera, uh, the time in between. So, so this plot shows like different data sets. So, so this paper is a few years old. Nowadays, my collection of temporal networks is maybe 150 different data sets, but here I, I have uh, much fewer. Okay, then okay, let me f flip this one pretty fast. So, so this is a study I made, like how to kind of project a stat uh, temporal network to a static network so that it contain it retains as much information as possible with respect to disease spreading. That, that's a, at least an example of an interesting question that that, uh, uh, that I encourage you to study. And I'll also, these are. I would make this a lot different today. I learned to. Uh, in this case, I didn't scan the entire parameter space. I I, I used a Spearman correlation coefficient that uh, is not appropriate for this. I still think the conclusions are probably true, but uh, I I learned a lot since this time. That's a. a so now I'm just showing you some of my own projects to give you some idea of what, what people can do. Another thing I was interested in is R0, the basic reproduction number, which is a very important uh, concept in mathematical uh, epidemiology, much because it is one of the few concepts that uh, went from uh, medical uh, mathematical ep epidemiology to medical epidemiology. And even yeah, Hollywood knows about it. So this is uh, a Kate. Winslet uh, writing R0 uh, and a screenshot from this film Contagion. So R0 is basically uh, a quantity that uh, shows how serious a disease is. And for medical people on the mass media too, they use R0 just as representing how serious a disease is for a population in general. So here you can see some examples of R0, and you see the, the childhood diseases, they are, have the highest R0, so essentially when they come to a susceptible population, they're just going to burn out in the population, and they have to wait until there are new people susceptible, born and grow up before they, a new wave can spread. But the, uh, Okay, so the R0, this quantity, measuring like how serious a disease is, comes from this original uh, differential equation formulation of the SIR model, where R0 is the ratio between the infection rate and the re recovery rate. And uh, disease can spread in the network if and only if R0 is larger than 1. 
this defines a, a epidemic threshold. But there are lots of problems. It's hard to estimate. Threshold isn't uh, one in practice. What does it mean with a threshold in a finite population? But also in a temporal network, uh, the outbreak size doesn't even have to be a monotonous function of R0. So in this paper, we used empirical contact data and simulate the full uh, parameter space of the SR model. We plot the outbreak size versus R0 and try to find out what kind of temporal network structure that creates the deviations. Um, okay, now something is a bit strange with this slide. Uh, but okay, this uh, slide is for one data set and every point is one point in the parameter space of the SIR. And if uh, this R0 is a perfect predictor of the average outbreak size, which is something that people implicitly assume, then this would all fall on one curve. But you see there is a spread. So this paper is about what are the temporal network structures that creates this spread. So what we do is that we, we characterize this, the shape of this, this banana shape of, of the points uh, as like a, so this kind of characterize how uh, R0 fails to uh, predict the outbreak size. And then we measure uh, many, many different uh, uh, network structures about the temporal, temporal network structures, both the kind of topology and the kind of like link activity intervent times and also the evolution if the say the uh, activity in the network is big in the beginning and small in the end or vice versa or if it's constant yeah so, so things like that and then we run uh, kind of tip, uh, just a standard uh, regression analysis to find what type of uh, temporal network structures that are important for the shape of this uh, banana basically so the width of the banana is uh, depends a lot on the kind of this kind of turnover of links and this kind of slow uh, temporal network structures. The only thing that uh, uh, where the static network structure uh, matters is the this kind of the spread in the vertical axis. And yeah, please read more about it. Uh, Another interesting problem is the vaccination problem. So usually it's formulated like this, that assume that we can vaccinate a fraction f of a population, then how can we pick these people to vaccinate using only the kind of local information, so only by interviewing people. And I recommend you to try this uh, app to understand this better. Now, the, in the static network, this vaccination problem was uh, uh, got a very nice solution by the this Israeli group Cohen, Havlin and Ben Abraham in 2002. It's called the uh, neighborhood vaccination and it goes like this that we, we pick a person at random then we ask the person to name a friend and then we vaccinate the friend not the person we called. And this is a good idea because the probability of picking someone with a high degree is proportional to the degree. So it's higher for for node with high degree. So it's a high chance that we uh, find a, a, like a hub in the network to vaccinate. So we had a, a kind of study where we, we kind of try to adapt this uh, neighborhood vaccination to temporal network. And now we can make it more realistic because we don't have to assume that the network doesn't change in time. We can use the past to predict the, the future. So essentially what we do is that we take a temporal network, break it in half, and then use the first as an experience period. Then at the midpoint, we assume everything happens. The disease starts, the vaccination happens, and then we simulate the disease spreading and the vaccination in the uh, second half of the data. And uh, so this is one example how the disease eventually spreads to everybody. So we try different kind of versions of this neighborhood vaccination. We pick, and two of them works well. So we pick a person uh, at random, and then we ask the person to name the most recent contact and vaccinate that one. And in this case, it saved one person. And then um, we can uh, pick a person at random and ask the person to 
name the most frequent throughout the experience period and vaccinate that one. And in this case, that it saved yeah, three. And in our paper, <laughs> we, we uh, this is the kind of success plot in this paper. So it shows the the outbreak size, how it was decreased. So whenever there are points in the yellow region, that's when um, this uh, uh, our method were more successful than neighborhood vaccination. So we can see the fact that there are points in yellow everywhere means that there is always a temporal network structure to exploit, or temporal structure to exploit. Um, but also different data sets respond in different ways. So this email data is different. And the, the reason which took a while to understand is that uh, in the email data, especially in that sense that the people in, that are there in the beginning and links that are there in the beginning, they are there in the end too. So there is no turnover of links and, and events. Now this is a very old study, so, so people have done it better. And I think in this paper, Maybe not, but I think they do use some kind of spectral method, kind of connecting better to this class than the one I used. Okay, so we're reaching towards the end of this uh, talk. So one thing I want to say more is like, wh what are interesting future directions? So, so one thing is like how to kind of properly model the contact patterns as temporal networks. What are the structures there? Then. We need better visualization. And then, of course, we have so many results for static networks. We want to know how can we uh, adjust them to uh, take temporal effects into account. And as I mentioned, uh, how to talk about time scales in temporal networks are actually not, people do that, but uh, there is no kind of uh, theory for it, no good theory. And then community detection, something I haven't mentioned at all, but this is also where people use uh, uh, spectral methods or non-negative uh, tensor factorization. Uh, so the, and just uh, once again, the philosoph philosophical question, what is a temporal community? Surely, like, uh, I mean, if, if you want it to mean something can, people that are kind of close to each other at the same time in a group, something like this, then, then it should also, it, it makes no sense to kind of split the entire population into communities. It makes even less sense than in a static network. So fundamentally different thing, community detection in temporal networks. Also how to design fast algorithms and analytical is tractable models. And uh, yeah, we do know from a randomization study that uh, time matters, but like how and like what kind of temporal structure or combination of temporal and topological structure that are the most important ones, we don't know. And uh, if you want to read more, then I do have a few review papers. I recommend this, the latest one, the top one. Uh, and there is a book by Naoki Masuda, who also lectures in this online course, and Renaud Lambiot, that is a bit more technical than my review papers. So I, I think for you, that this is a better choice than my review papers. And uh, in the Temporal Network Specialized uh, Epidemiology, uh, uh, Naoki Masuda and I have an edited book volume on Springer. And uh, yeah, if you want to he hear more about community detection, uh, I mentioned this review paper is, is very good, uh, in particular because I know many people are interested in community de detection. I didn't have any slides prepared for this talk about it, so so the, uh, yeah, please check out this review by Rosetta and Kasper. Okay, with that, I have to say thank you. Uh, it's been an interesting experience to record this video lecture, and I want to uh, thank all my collaborators too. Naoki Masuda, Yari Saramecki, Fredrik Lilleros, Luis Rocha, Sung Min Lee, Farid Bakarimi, Juan Perotti, Taro Takaguchi, Tao Li, Yuan Bai, and illustrations by Mi Jin Lee. So thank you very much. Bye bye.